Herzlich willkommen bei unserer digitalen Ausstellungseröffnung From a New Yorker's Perspective mit Fotografien von Christopher Makes im Amerika aus München. Wir freuen uns ganz besonders, diese Ausstellung heute eröffnen zu können. Mein Name ist Maike Fingenberger, ich bin die Geschäftsführerin des Amerika-Hauses und ich werde Sie jetzt durch die nächsten Minuten unseres Programms führen. Heute ist ein ganz besonderer Tag für alle Amerikaner, es ist der Force of July, der normalerweise viel gefeiert wird, offen, öffentlich gefeiert wird, große Partys, Feuerwerk, überall. Es ist aber auch ein Familienfest und es ist auch ein Fest, ähm, bei dem man sich Gedanken macht über den Zustand der Nation und sein eigenes Verhältnis dazu. All diese offiziellen Feiern mussten ausfallen. Ähm, der Zustand der Nation ist ein sehr schwieriger, die USA sind in der Krise. Wir hatten auch geplant, hier im Amerika-Haus groß zu eröffnen, weil nach vierjähriger Renovierungszeit unser Gebäude und unser Originalgebäude am Karolinenplatz wieder eröffnet werden können sollte. Allerdings sind auch bei uns die großen Feierlichkeiten alle ausgefallen. Umso mehr freue ich mich, dass wir heute eine kleine Feier mit Christopher Makes, dem Künstler, durchführen können und mit ein paar Grußworten, die uns überbracht wurden, und ähm, im nächsten Jahr ganz bestimmt eine große Feier mit allen durchführen können. Aber heute schon mal ein bisschen die Türen öffnen, weil unsere Ausstellung dann ab morgen zu sehen wird. Und Sie können sich das generalsanierte Amerika-Haus auch anschauen. Wie gesagt, wir haben zwei Grußworte bekommen. Besonders gefreut haben wir uns über das Grußwort von Herrn Staatsminister Siebler, ähm, das Ihnen jetzt eingespielt wird. Dear Miss Consul General Megan Gregonis, dear Mr. Makers, dear Miss Zwingenberger, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, I cannot greet you today in person as I would wish. Instead, I am extending a virtual welcome to you all on this special American holiday, the 4th of July. As a historian, I know how important the Declaration of Independence is to all the Americans. This day represents values that connect all of us. And the America House in Munich stands for this connection. It stands for the great friendship of our two nations. Of course, I would like to give a special thanks to Christopher Makers for giving us an insight into a very interesting artistic period in New York, the United States and the whole world. And for participating in this event by a video call during a time that is certainly not easy for a New Yorker. And thank you very much, also the US General Consulate here in Munich for supporting this great exhibition. Liebe Frau Gregonis, das Amerika Haus hier in München war und ist ein ganz besonderer Ort. Es hat unzählige Generationen geprägt. Es hat vielfältige Verbindungen geschaffen und es hat unzählbare transatlantische Freundschaften zwischen Menschen gestiftet. Das Amerika Haus ist auch mir persönlich sehr, sehr wichtig, ich war ja am Montag auch bei der offiziellen Eröffnung mit dabei, denn dieses Amerika-Haus hat einen ganz klaren Auftrag. Es muss ein offenes Haus für alle Bürgerinnen und Bürger sein. Es muss Brücken bauen. Und es muss junge Menschen für transatlantische Beziehungen interessieren. Und das, wie wir wissen, in nicht ganz einfachen Zeiten. Ich freue mich deshalb umso mehr, dass dieses Amerika-Haus nach der Renovierung wieder für die Öffentlichkeit zugänglich ist und das gleich mit einer so beeindruckenden Ausstellung. Deshalb danke ich dem gesamten Team des Amerika-Hauses und allen, die am Gelingen dieser Ausstellung mitgewirkt haben. And to all visitors, enjoy this very special photo exhibition and the new premises of America House Munich. Vielen herzlichen Dank, Herr Staatsminister Siebler, für diese äh, wunderbaren Worte, die die Geschichte des Hauses aufgreifen, aber eben auch sich mit unsere Ausstellung schon befassen. Wir freuen uns tatsächlich sehr, eine so tolle Kunstausstellung präsentieren zu können, weil Kunst, Theater, Musik, amerikanische Schauspieler auf der Bühne, amerikanische Filme im großen Theatersaal, die Jazzmusiker ganz früh in den 50er Jahren auf der Bühne des Amerika-Hauses, all diese Projekte waren extrem wichtig für das Interesse an den USA, und auch ähm, für die Vermittlung. Das Interesse aus deutscher Sicht ist sehr groß gewesen. Aber ähm, im Amerika-Haus wurden dann Amerikaner präsentiert und man hat sie live gesehen und man hat sie eben auch kennengelernt. 
Und insofern sind wir sehr froh, dass wir dieses Haus haben und dass wir auch die Möglichkeit haben, Interaktionen zu bieten. Im Moment leider digital, aber hoffentlich auch bald schon wieder, wenn Sie in unsere Ausstellung kommen, die wir ab Sonntag auch für die Öffentlichkeit wieder zugänglich machen, ähm, auch hier im Haus. Insofern freue ich mich ganz besonders, dass an diesem Tag Megan Gregonis, die Generalkonsulin in München, an diesem großen Feiertag in den USA, aber auch für Sie ein Feiertag heute in Deutschland, sich ebenfalls bereit erklärt hat, uns ein Grußwort zu schicken. Und das möchte ich Ihnen jetzt zeigen. Sehr geehrter Herr Staatsminister Siebler, sehr geehrte Frau Dr. Zwingenberger, Liebe Maike, Freunde des Amerika-Hauses, heute ist ein symbolträchtiger Tag für die Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika. Jedes Jahr erinnert der 4. Juli an die Ratifizierung der Unabhängigkeitserklärung vor 244 Jahren. Der 4.7.1776 war ein Meilenstein in der Entwicklung unseres Landes hin zu einer lebendigen, dauerhaften Demokratie. Wie Sie vielleicht wissen, stamme ich aus Philadelphia. Dort wurde zwölf Jahre nach der Unabhängigkeitserklärung unsere Verfassung aus der Taufe gehoben. Sie ist die älteste noch gültige schriftliche Verfassung der Welt. Freiheit oder Freedom ist der zentrale Begriff in den Zusatzartikeln unserer Verfassung. Freiheit ist auch der rote Faden der sich durch diese Ausstellung von Werken des großen amerikanischen Künstlers Christopher Marcos sieht. Sie ist die Freiheit, die eigene sexuelle Orientierung und der Identität nicht im Verborgenen halten zu müssen oder die Freiheit von Diskriminierung aufgrund der Hautfarbe oder auch das Recht, sich frei in der Welt bewegen zu können. Anders als es das DDR-Regime für seine Bürger vorgesehen hatte. Was könnte diesen Reigen an Freiheiten besser symbolisieren als die Freiheitsstatue, deren fotografisches Abbild Teil dieser Ausstellung ist? Demokratie bedeutet freilich harte und kontinuierliche Arbeit. Wir sollten Freiheit nie als selbstverständlich erachten. Sie ist ein kostbares Gut. Unser Engagement ist gefragt, täglich aufs Neue. Oder wie US-Außenminister Pompeo es jüngst anlässlich des Virtual Copenhagen Democracy Summit formulierte, diese Anstrengungen spiegeln das Bekenntnis zu den Grundwerten und unser ständiges Streben nach einer perfekteren Union wider. So sind wir eben und wir teilen diese Werte mit unseren europäischen Freunden. Wir sind sehr glücklich, mit Ansichten eines New, York, ein, eines New Yorkers Fotografien von Christopher Marcos die erste Ausstellung im frisch renovierten Amerika-Haus beisteuern zu können. Anfang der Woche dürfen wir die Wiedereröffnung dieser Institution am historischen Standort beiwohnen. Ein bewegendes Erlebnis. Natürlich hatten wir uns mehr Publikum für dieses geschicksträchtige Ereignis gewünscht. Aber wir leben in Zeiten der Pandemie und so müssen wir lernen, uns zu bescheiden. Just as we would like for this exhibit opening to be attended by masses of art lovers, we would love to have the man of the hour here in person, Christopher Makos. Mr. Makos, it is so great to have you with us today, if only virtually. Allow me to briefly introduce you, although you certainly don't need much of an introduction. Christopher Makos was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, grew up in California, and moved to New York City after high school. He studied architecture in Paris and briefly worked as an apprentice to Man Ray. Much has been said and written about Makos' relationship with Andy Warhol. They were close friends, frequent collaborators, travel buddies. Several of their joint trips led them to Berlin, the divided capital, in the early 1980s. But they also saw history unfold in 1989, the peaceful revolution born out of a people's yearning for freedom. Freedom. To wrap up, 
Warhol called Makos the most modern photographer in America. His iconic photographs have been shown in museums and galleries around the world, such as the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, the Tate Modern in London, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the IVAM in Valencia, and the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. Today, you join us virtually, but we certainly haven't given up hope that we will be able to welcome you personally here this year. Fingers crossed. Before we turn it over to you, Mr. Makos, allow me to say a few words of thanks to Torsten Kasper, who expertly curated this exhibit, and to Micah Zwingenberger and the dedicated America House program staff team who helped put on this amazing show. Thank you all. Christopher, you're the man of the moment, and I, I feel so honored to have the chance to talk with you. Know, I, I, it would be much better to have you here uh, live, but still, it's, it's a very uh, special moment for me. And um, I would like to start this conversation because I really think that our audience is most interested in, in hearing what you have to say and not listen to me. Um, my whole background is, is just full with um, images from your, your books and also our exhibition. Um, uh, but I, I would like to know, you, you have such a broad body of work. Um, we show 25 of your photographs here. Can you explain a little bit how um, these were put together, what you had in mind with, with these specific 25 photographs that we have here in Munich now? Well, when this, oh, hi there. Oh, I, by the way, I want to thank everybody for putting this together, especially Casper, who curated this. And as you know, to answer your question, this show began in Munich and it was supposed to be at the ambassador's residence, <clears throat> you know, for a couple of months. But then, of course, this science event happened all over the world. And so I had the longest exhibition ever to run anywhere. So I was really, uh, you know, I expected to be in Berlin just a few months. And then I've been in there for like four or five months or six months. So I am delighted to be, I'm delighted for my children, AKA my photographs to be spending a lot of time in Germany. I mean, this exhibition, which I have to thank everybody for putting together there at the America House, Dominique and Mika and, uh, and all the people that have worked on this exhibition. Um, these pictures were originally put together to sort of capture a particular time in, um, I want to say American culture, but it was really New York culture that was happening. And our New York culture affected the way the rest of America went and the, the way that we uh, were seen culturally in the rest of the world. And of course, this, this particular moment of these photographs with people from the arts, from music, from the theater, from the movies, all of these people contributed to the, that particular moment in American and New York cultural history a history that hasn't been seen for a while. But as I mentioned to a lot of my friends that this pandemic, this sort of social event um, that's happening around the world, um, I think is going to bring a refresh. And especially for a city like New York, which has become so expensive and so difficult for young people or creative people to inhabit our landscape that this event uh, is going to bring, make everything more inexpensive. It, uh, the real estate market will be less, uh, uh, rentals will be less. So I think people will be able to come to New York City and the creative arts I think will flourish. When you have events like this, um, I mean, can you imagine in Hollywood, all the screenplays and all the writers, everybody sitting at home, writing about this event, about how they feel personally, about how it affects us all. Uh, and can you imagine the science fiction movies which are being written about at this moment? So back to my photos, of course. Um, they, each and every one of them means something. 
And I know that uh, Dominique, through you, Mika, asked me to pick some of my favorites. And as I mentioned earlier in our private talk, um, I, um, I don't really have favorites, but I, I wanted to mention three pictures, which are quite timely because as I mentioned earlier, um, my particular language is the language of photography. And so although these pictures are more historical than they are contemporary, they, they, the language has not changed. And so the language is still, it still speaks. And in the case of a picture like Andy holding the American flag, painting the American flag, it's like we as Americans are, are really searching to find out who we are. And that, because America is such a young country, um, it, every few years it, it has this, this constant question of like, who are we? And it comes around every four years when Americans vote for their president. It's sort of like, who are we? And so this picture of Andy painting the American flag has a great meaning considering we're only four months away from a next election. So I love that this picture is there at the America House in Munich. It means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Another pic, go ahead. May I ask a question? Because oh. I, it, is, it is a very iconic uh, picture and I think it is also very well known. That's also why we, we chose it for our, um, for marketing the exhibition here in Munich. And Andy Warhol, of course, is an icon in, uh, in himself. But I would like to ask you, Christopher, do you think that because you, you met Andy Warhol and you um, were part of the whole factory in New York and, and you just mentioned that it was such a, a special um, crowd of people, but do you think dealing with the flag, because it's, it's so interesting that it's upside down. Um, do you think that Andy Warhol was some kind of a periodic um, painter actually? Um, because he also was very adaptive to the capitalist um, system uh, in his time. So would you think that the patriotic is also something that is important for his art? Um, you know, I, it's interesting. Number one, you have just mentioned something to me about my picture that I never realized which is that the flag is upside down. I never noticed that, okay? So thank you for, tell, for making me see something new in one of my photos. Number two, uh, you said was he patriotic. Well, a Andy, is, uh, people always ask me, why is he still so popular? Well, he's still so popular because Andy, when he was looking for inspiration, he didn't look to Europe for inspiration. He wasn't... Um, inspired by Europe. He was inspired by quintessentially American things. The Campbell soup can, the Coca-Cola bottle, the car crash, Elvis Presley. So when you say was he patriotic, uh, I'm not so sure he was patriotic, but he was very American. And so when you look at all of his early, the, uh, an example of a sculpture, the Brillo uh, box, so, so uh, you know, uh, Brillo uh, boxes, um, he was capitalistic in a, in a way that America is capitalistic. You know what I mean? And so he, he didn't go after being a capitalist or American. He was a true reflection of what was going on in America at the time. He was, he was that person that held up the mirror to you and me and to all of us and said, this, this is what we are as our culture. I mean, even if you go in a shop in, in Europe or anywhere, sometimes you can see a row of Campbell soup cans, tomato soup cans. Uh, and so if you go into a store, you can always see Andy Warhol, you know? So that's why he was a great equalizer. And to answer your question, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't as patriotic as he was American. Um. Thanks. Yeah, I can I can really understand that because I kind of um, misunderstood uh, Andy Warhol for a while. I think uh, with a very German perspective on on the New York scene, uh, being really young at the time, but always focusing on these New York artists as um, standing for something very um, open and and also critical somehow. 
And with um, with and we talked about the capitalist moment in that. Um, actually, you, you I think you can be critical and capitalist at the same time. And um, some of the issues that were focused on, and Megan Vigonis in her in her welcome remarks also was focusing on individual freedom. So I think that is something very much connected to. Um, that group of people. And I think, Christopher, it would also be wonderful to, to talk about another, um, another of your images. And you said that those are not your favorite ones, but the ones that speak to you. And I, I can tell you that um, the one that you, you pick also speaks to all of us. So um, would you like to comment a little bit on the Jean-Michel Bastiat uh, image that you have, the photograph? It's just very specific. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's particularly, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, when you started to introduce me, I, I was talking about um, the photos still seem quite contemporary to me. And of course, if you've been watching in the news or the media, we've been having a lot of marches in America about Black Lives Matter. And so um, during this time with Basquiat and Michelle, um, he, uh, he was tired of being the token black artist. You know, um, he just wanted to be the artist, not the black artist, but the artist. And so because he was that person that when we took this picture of him, um, I had an inflatable globe. And if you notice, he is holding up Africa. It's, it's the way you mentioned to me about the flag being upside down. I'm mentioning about this, this the globe, the and it's important that it's not a plastic globe; it's an inflatable globe that can be deflated. So, uh, but we when we inflated it, we made sure he held held up the Africa side of the globe to point up the heritage of who he is and where his family comes from. And uh, well, his family didn't come from the Caribbean, but ultimately, all of, of uh, his family came from Africa. So that particular picture has some meaning to me at the moment, um, especially for us Americans who need to reflect on what's going on here in America. And the other picture that kind of speaks to me too is the picture of divine. Um, and divine is not a trans person uh, because LBGTQA uh, civil rights are really in the forefront here in the United States. And Divine was an actress, an actor, and an interesting person. But um, we've, this has been so much in, in culture and in media right now. And um, somebody like Divine, and I miss these kind of creatures, these kind of individuals that can be that are so totally able to be themselves and to be free to be who they are. And if anything about my exhibition, when people are walking around looking at my pictures, all of these people are individuals that express themselves early on, they knew who they were. If I have any message to anybody is to learn how to love yourself first and once you are able to love yourself you become free to love others around you and you become free to appreciate what you see in front of you and that's what this exhibition is personal freedom and the idea to express yourself in, in the best way that you know how um it, it's really great uh christopher that you you told us that you send out some invitations to this um to this event uh, worldwide because I uh, have the information here in the chat that Stephen Thornton in, in Paris has joined us and he's he has obviously been um, or he's uh, at lunch with uh, Bastia's assistant so um, and he asked us to please ask you to talk a little bit about the beautiful encounter so maybe if you would like to talk about that encounter, I think it would be great. I would like to ask you one more thing about the, uh, the Basquiat photograph, because we actually, I have to tell you that we, we, we wanted to choose it for our exhibition, um, for, the, for the outside and for the, the yeah. but we realized that today, 
it's very, it's iconic, but if you don't know Jean-Michel Basquiat as an artist, it looks very much like an eye stock photo. With it's, um, it's like a what? An eye stock photo. Eye oh, stock, which, oh yeah. Theme, which would have the theme of a black man, I have to admit that, a black man holding up the globe with the Africa part. That is something that you could use for an event on diversity or something like that. So oh, I really? didn't realize how much the times have changed but um, also how these images have been used. And you can understand right away because you, you described that um, Jean-Michel Basquiat has felt as a token. I think that is also something that has led us to this, I, I would call it eye stock iconography, that yeah. you can use certain images to indicate your, your openness. And this one would work very well. Do you think that is fair or is it rather unfair to say that? No, 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 absolutely. As a matter of fact, my invitation that I sent out to the world is that image. So, yeah, so I'm glad that we were thinking in the same way because although it's not, it's not the one that the America House is using for their general image, I, I sent it out to all of my uh, friends, collectors, people that watch my work and like like my work. So that so we're we're getting it both ways. We're getting Andy an American flag from you. You're getting Basquiat from me. So no, we're all on the same page here. And um, again, maybe commenting on on divine again, I, I think it's really interesting that you made a difference between um, being a drag queen, which is something that is um, a rather outside perspective on yeah. a person and being a comedian, because I think that you you talk about Divine as being a, a comedian or an actor, actually. Yeah. Um, it, it is also something that uh, I think is really important today, the, the difference between self-identification and identification from others. So it's really wonderful that we seem to have made big steps in a direction that your self-identification is more allowed also um, in, uh, in a public scenario than that identification from others. But um, I would like to know, because these images all are very vivid also, what was the atmosphere like when you, when you took your photographs, especially this one with Divine, I like that really much. Um, she's laughing, but it's, it's also, it's still, um, a photograph that is like a still, like a film still. So can you describe that a little bit, how um, you, you arrange your camera and all that, how you took these photographs in, in these scenarios? Well, you know, um, all of my photographs are pretty much portraits of a moment. So sometimes they're not technically perfect. Sometimes they might not even be in focus. Sometimes they're, like I said, they're just, they, they may not be the uh, perfect details of everything. But for me, it's about capturing a particular moment when I'm doing a portrait. And that portrait was done at the factory at 860 Broadway, uh, which is at 17th Street and Broadway in New York City. And if any of you have been to New York, uh, you know, that's where Union Square is. And that Andy's factory was right uh, on the third floor overlooking McDonald's. So it's very interesting because that building 860 Broadway still exists, it's still there. And uh, if you want to go see the factory, it is now on the third floor has become Petco. If you don't know what Petco is, Petco is a shop for your pets. If you have a dog or a cat or anything. So I find it so interesting that in the sort of madcap zoo-like world of Andy Warhol in the 70s and 80s, all the creatures and animals that occupied the zoo at the time now has been replaced by Petco. So it's not such a far stretch, you know what I mean? If we're all animals and creatures in this world, if, it, if, if the Warhol thing could have turned into anything, it's great that it turned into a Petco. Um, the, the Petco uh, thing is, is really interesting because you, you indicate that things change uh, over time and you're focusing on, on creatures and um, different um, differences. But um, 
I would like to actually also um, focus a little bit on the different scenarios that you have in your exhibition, because we talked about the factory and New York. And Christopher, you, you allowed me to also pick uh, a photograph that I would like to discuss. And okay. I actually chose the Fassbinder photograph because it is a different scenario. And um, I think that we will be able to also show our audience that photograph. It is actually taken in Berlin. So that is a very, very different um, scenario. And I would like to ask you um, what it was like, because, because that is uh, the last moment um, of the filming of Querelle, actually. And um, I think it is um, compared also to the other photographs, which are portraits of just one person. Um, it is also very much uh, vivid because these three male figures um, interact, but are also posing. So I, I would be really interested to hear how you were taking this photograph. Um, well, you know, really my studio is inside of my camera. My studio is not an external thing. Sure, uh, often a studio is an external object or thing, but my camera is the studio and I, I set up my subjects in the studio. And in this case, it was much simpler because we were already going on a set. You know, often people, photographers, they refer to as um, come to the studio, the set is already set up, we're ready to go. So in this case with Fassbender, I took my studio onto his set. His set was already set up and that's how I was able to get these sort of, um, capture these moments in time with, um, with Fassbinder and then the actor, the two actors on each side. The one is the famous German actor, tell me his name. Do you know his name? Uh, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I thought you Germans would know. I thought you guys would know. I actually, um, and I, I wanted to find it out because actually um, Hannah Schigula and others, we know, we Germans know a lot of the Fassbinder uh, crowd, yeah. but I, I didn't um, recognize the person in the picture. So we, there's something that we have to, I, that's my homework, I'll, I'll find it out. But okay. could you, um, Christopher, could, could you describe, because I, I, I have the feeling that your um, scenarios are also very much um, intertwined with the cities that you are in and taking your, your pictures and your photos. So wh what do you think Berlin in the 1980s, of course, is a very different city um, from New York in the 1980s. Um, is there something that you can you could tell when you, when you were in Berlin with your studio on, uh, on your tour? Um, in Berlin in the 1980s, or would you say that the, the crowds of musicians, actors, um, writers um, that were together also had some kind of a parallel um, world that was created in New York and Berlin at the time? Well, you know, um, all cities that have some kind of tension going on, whether it's financial tension or political tension, in the case of Berlin, you had the political tension because you had the Berlin Wall. So, the, it, you know, in our case, New York City uh, was kind of funky in the 70s and 80s. It, uh, it, it didn't have money. Um, um, you know, it, it, the parks weren't clean. Uh, of course, the, the, what's going to happen in New York City, it's going to go back to the 70s because with what's happening now with the pandemic and all the things that are happening, the real estate things are going to go down. Uh, it's going to be cheaper to come. I can't wait for you all to come to New York City and visit. Um, but what me that means there'll be less tax money to go to the state, which means things are going to get funkier. And so, but what happens when they get funkier? It bring it's the rise of the artists. And so uh, that kind of tension that was both in New York and Berlin at the time. In New York, it was the financial tension and in Berlin it was the political tension so you had a really strong sense of an art community that wasn't 
controlled or manipulated by certain power players um, the way the art market is manipulated now. The art market existed, I wouldn't say in a vacuum, but it existed on its own. It wasn't controlled by a few big art players. So um, that's the way Berlin felt. There were a lot of small galleries. There was a lot of, it was just a different thing. I mean, it's so interesting that beautiful um, museum is all glass and black. What's that museum you have in Berlin? Um, it's a famous one, but I mean, there was a Jenny Holzer exhibition there, I remember at the time. And every time I've been there subsequently, uh, they couldn't afford to have exhibitions because they don't have the money. It's like, um, it was, it's unusual how so many times I've been back to Berlin and the space was never open or not being able to be used. But when I was there in the late seventies and early eighties, there was mm -hmm. always an exhibition going on there. And so you, when you were uh, talking about the New York scenario and the factory in New York, you, you mentioned implicitly that it was over after a certain time. And um, I think you're absolutely right that the ten this moment of tension is true for both scenarios because I would also see the 1980s in the US uh, with Regonomics and the new um, the new right and so on as a very uh, of course conservative period of time after the 1970s yeah. and Germany is very different with the political situation of the East and the West um, so there's also a lot of tension but it is a very different kind of tension um, but for New York you said and I think it's it's um, true with the factory also that there were different periods and there was a very um, open and vivid um, first period. And then later on also how people acted uh, was very much connected to the su success that was there and the money that was involved. Yeah. But I think it, that is, is really different with Berlin. And you, you just said you, you came back to Berlin a couple of times, but you say that the Fassbinder scenario, the wall, the, the photo that you took of the wall, that that's also a specific, specific moment in time and when you came back later on and and I would like to know did you come back before um, the German reunification in these years afterwards did you like um, chronicle the development in in Berlin as well is there a kind of um, chronicle with Berlin because I know that you you have been back recently of course um, but do, do you think their Berlin scenario has been a, just specific for the time in this Fassbinder scenario? Um, well, fortunately, uh, capital cities like Berlin and like New York City, they are vibrant under any circumstance, they are vibrant for because they are, one, they're capital cities and two, there's always an, a, a flux of people moving in and out. I mean, a good friend of mine moved from New York City because he didn't feel like he was being stimulated by the city. So he moved to Berlin. He stayed there for a while and then he didn't feel like he was being stimulated there. So he came back. So, I mean, uh, sort of the creative arts always ebb and flow. And uh, in New York City, the um, because of things like Reaganomics and then we had uh, Mr. Giuliani as the mayor of New York City, um, and now we're in another special moment, which is unusual. But uh, capitalism um, does affect big money and capitalism does affect how cultures move. And, you know, during the 70s and 80s, and as you mentioned, there were four factories. I was part of the last two factories and I was part of the factory, the, the second to last factory. You know, that's was after Andy got shot. After Andy got shot, um, I don't want to say the factor got more serious. They just got more, they paid more attention to um, things. It wasn't like anybody could just come by the factory then because before Andy got shot, that was the Valerie. Anybody could just get on the elevator and come up and that was it. So um, the factory that I know, I, it was that very professional factory. It's the factory that, um, that, you know, Andy was working with uh, different German art dealers coming to, to Germany, doing portraits of uh, German industrialists, 
Um, and that's how I got to know uh, so many of the trips, so many of my trips to Germany were into Cologne. Uh, but we'd fly into Cologne and we'd go to Bonn because Bonn at the time was the capital. And I, no disrespect, but for me, nothing was, could be more boring than Bonn. You know what I mean? I, I, I love you people, don't get me wrong, but the, I, we have cities just like that here in America. You go to the, it's a beautiful, pretty town, but there's nothing going on. So we would go to Bonn. I'd always say, why can't we just stay in Cologne? You know what I mean? Which is only what, 25 minutes away or something. But no, the art dealer, it was Hermann Wunscher, and he always wanted us to stay in Bonn. And I kept saying, please, can't we stay in Cologne? <laughs> and, um, and that was my experiences then. But no matter what, I'm such an optimist, and I believe in the, uh, I, I believe in fun. And so no matter what I'm doing, who I'm photographing, where I am right now, in this very moment, I'm all about just appreciating what's going on at the moment because that's all we have. The past uh, is for me are all these wonderful photographs and I appreciate my own history. I appreciate what I have. Uh, but the most important moment is right now being here with you, uh, Mika, to be here with the people that are online. This, this is to me what's important. Um, and the future is just up there a little bit uh, but like I said, it's, it's the future. It's not now. The past is something that we respect. And I, 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 I respect the past a lot, but for me, the most important thing is to be here now. And that's why this exhibition is so important because I've taken something that's about history and made it now. And I think these photographs still, some of them still look quite contemporary. Um, I think when the viewer looks at them, um, you can you can see what's going on in the people's eyes, especially in the pictures of Andy and well in all the pictures. So um, I'm happy that we're opening this tomorrow. I'm so deeply saddened that I couldn't be there in person. I mean, I told so many of my friends, I said, you know, what could be more fun than to be in Munich in the summertime? You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, November 9th, if we get to be together in November 9th, it'll be great, but it'll be the winter. <laughs> so, um, um, you have a question? I, I, I still uh, hope that we, we can bring you here maybe next summer because the next summer will be as beautiful as this one in Munich. Okay. Um, I, I also think that um, there's a lot to say about your, your photographs, so we, we will find a chance to, to bring you. And we, we plan for something, so I, I hope that the situation yeah. allows you to come. Yeah. And I, because you asked for two photographs that, that I would like you to focus on, and I think we, we can talk for a long time um, about the, the ma the, a lot of the mails that you have in your collection, because I, I think Keith Haring is a really interesting artist, and I have a personal connection with Keith Haring as well. My my husband, when we, he, he was really young, he used to draw these uh, Keith Haring motifs. So we found them on garage doors, and that that's something. So that that pop art moment uh, with Keith Haring is really interesting. Also, you have Matt Dillon and Rob Lowe, um, very beautiful young men in in your collection. There's yeah. Keith Haring and. Um, very iconic also with his glasses and his hair and everything. Matt Dillon and Rob Lowe, who, who in their careers uh, then turned out to be very different uh, people actually. But I was surprised to see, and that's what I would like you to focus on for a moment. I was surprised to see Georgia O'Keeffe in that collection because uh, in your photos. I wouldn't expect her to be with that crowd in New York. Can you comment on that, Christopher? Well, the thing is, uh, <laughs> oh, well, George O'Keefe was one of our most important. You know, I always have this discussion about, um, you know, if you look at the art scene, there are many more famous men artists than there are women. And I, this, I, I don't want it to sound strange, but the thing is, women are the ultimate artists. And this is a compliment. They can create another human being. You know, men can't do that. Um, and that's why I think men have this desire, uh, sculptors to create a sculpture or for men to do a painting. Not that women don't, they do. But women 
have this ultimate creation that can create things. But uh, Georgia O'Keeffe came to me. Um, she didn't come to me. It was uh, Andy wanted to do, uh, Andy loved to trade with other artists. So Andy wanted to trade one of his portraits for a George O'Keefe painting. So we both went up to see her at the time and she was there with Juan Hamilton, who was the sculptor that was her kind of boyfriend at the time. And um, Juan wanted me to only take the picture of both of them together. And so he was, he wouldn't move very, he was very close to her, you know, like, right. And I wanted a picture of her. I didn't want a picture of him, to be honest. So um, I took these pictures in a very cagey way so that I just cropped him out of the picture. So it's really a portrait of Juan Hamilton and Georgia O'Keeffe. But in the end, it's my portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe. So, um, that's 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 the behind the picture story. Yeah. And, and, go ahead. I, I think we have one person who is really interested in in another story and um, keeps commenting. And I would just um, read to you, Christopher, what I'm supposed to ask you. Can you ask, ask Christopher to speak specifically of that historic encounter with Bastia on October 4th, 1982? And that obviously also, if you uh, want to comment, has to do with um, your techniques because um, the comment is also on Polaroids and other um, ways of, of photography. So um, do you know what um, is referred to, what Stephen is referring to, that specific moment on October 4th, 1982, because it, I'm, I'm noisy, that's kind of- Oh, good luck. Come on, 30 <laughs> years ago, I, you, you think that I can remember something from 30 years ago on a certain date? I mean, that's something that a savant could do, you know what I mean? Uh, but I mean, really, I, I mean, so many of my friends that, you know, we were there and it, you know, the thing is, if you, if that, I'm sorry, absolutely not. I, that's, that's why I, I take pictures. I take pictures because it's proof that I have a life. In other words, otherwise it's just something from my memory, but <laughs> I love that. Somebody asking me October 4th, 1982. Yeah. Really, um, I have not a clue as to what I was doing that day. Uh, but a, yeah. okay. I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I think the last comment that you just made is really interesting though. Um, why are you taking your, your photograph? It, it seems the way you described it that um, you also, uh, your photography is also some kind of a diary and uh, it just, it um, keeps track of, of what, what you're doing and what your motives are and what your values are. And I would just um, for, for a short moment like to come back to, because it's 4th of July and we talked about individual freedom. So that would be my last question for you, maybe Christopher, even if we could continue for a very long time and I hope we will when you come to Munich. Um, what does the 4th of July um, with, what does it mean to you today? Uh, with, because you, you have been dealing in your photography and your art so much with individual freedom values, but also um, specific expressions of the self and so on. So what does 4th of July mean to you? Um, you know, I guess I could come up with a really smart, clever answer or something uh, completely political or something. But 4th of July is that kind of day to forget about everything and just be ha just it's a kind of American reminder that uh, we're lucky enough to live in a country that's so diverse because, you know, um, it's, I'm always reminded that like when I go to Germany, it's mostly Germans. When I go to Italy, it's mostly Italians. When I go to Greece, it's mostly Greeks. And I love that. It's so much fun because I love to dig into these specific cultures, but America is that, um, that great melting pot where there are, are Greeks and Americans and Italians and Chinese, and we're all kind of mixed up in this sort of bouillabaisse. And hopefully we can all figure out how to get along. And hope we have been for the longest time that great example, but especially New York City has been that great example of how to get along in a small space because Manhattan 
is like a Manhattan, New York City is like a bubble. Uh, we often want to be our own country uh, because the way we deal with ourselves is so different than the rest of America. So it, the 4th of July is that kind of uh, reminder. And of course, the other part of that day is hot dogs, hamburgers, uh, barbecues, chicken wings, uh, sitting outside, um, fireworks that scare the dogs. Um, and of course, this year it's it's at a much different level. Uh, so it's I think this year it'll be much more inner, uh, more reflective because there's not going to be as many fireworks, maybe not as many hot dogs, maybe not as many hamburgers. But uh, listen, I'm so happy to be there with you guys. I'm desperate once again. I, if I could give you all the biggest hugs and just be close to you, I'd kiss you all over everyone. I mean. I'm desperate to be with people. I, I enjoy the company and of people and friendship. And it's, it would be great fun to be there like, talking about my pictures. But this will happen. Well, that was a great final remark. Thank you so much. We would also love, I would like to hug you and uh, walk around in our wonderful exhibition area because we, I have to admit, we are really happy that we have moved back and are now able to show um, great artwork like yours. Thank you so much, Christopher Marcos, for this wonderful conversation. And um, we press our thumbs that we can really have um, a person-to-person -person meeting with all people interested in Munich in fall. Um, before that, though, I would like to invite everybody, and I will do my Abmoderation in German now. I would okay. like everybody to come to the exhibition which is open daily um, starting tomorrow not daily I'm sorry um, Sunday and then Monday to Friday so it's open tomorrow 10 to 4 10 bis 16 Uhr und danach immer 16 bis 20 Uhr um, wir bitten Sie wie es überall jetzt noch üblich ist die Corona Bedingungen zu akzeptieren also Sie müssen sich auch bei uns registrieren lassen aber ansonsten haben wir zu den gerade genannten Zeiten die Ausstellung geöffnet. Ähm, Sie können auch gerne über unsere Social-Media-Kanäle und den Hashtag A New Yorkers Perspective uns Bilder schicken, die Sie selber in der Ausstellung machen. Der Eintritt ist frei, wie immer im Amerika-Haus. Ähm, and now my final thanks go to Staatsminister Siebler for the welcome remarks and also to Megan Pegonis for her welcome remarks, the Consul General in Munich to the staff at the consulate here and the embassy in Berlin, because this exhibition and the co-working would not have been possible without these people. Um, besonders on my team, Eva, Joanna, Dominic, and Andy, without them, I wouldn't be here the way I am. I, I would look very different. Um, and of course, to you, Christopher Makers, I think it was a wonderful conversation and opening ceremony on the 4th of July. So thank you so much for this event today. Thanks. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for, for having me there. Thanks, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>